A couple years ago, I used to serve tables at a shitty steak joint in one of the Carolinas. I met a gentleman while working one Friday night. He had been sitting at the bar, eyeing me, all evening. He was a good-looking older guy, so of course I struck up a conversation with him. I noticed right away that there was something not quite right with him, but I couldn't exactly put my finger on it during the few hours he was there, talking to me as I ran drinks back and forth from the bar to my tables. He smiled a lot, but the smiles felt empty and never reached his eyes. At any rate, he asked to meet up with me for a beer or two the following night after I got off work. Despite the small red flags I had picked up on, I agreed. I ended up meeting him the next night at a local bar that I frequented. He had a beer waiting for me when I walked up, which made me immediately uneasy. Not trying to be rude, I told him it had been a rough day and I was going to go for something a little stronger, so I ordered myself a whiskey sour and came back to where he was sitting. The little patio area outside the bar was packed. He had managed to wrangle the little bench in the back for us, so I had no choice but to sit as far as I could on the other side of the bench from him so that I didn't have to touch him. He seemed to notice that I was initially trying not to touch him and kept moving closer. He kept doing the man-spreading thing so his leg would graze mine. I kept my body facing forward, not towards him, cradling my drink in towards my chest and a cigarette in my hand on his side. I was regretting agreeing to go out for a drink in the first place and was hoping my body language would be enough to awkwardly end the night. We started talking and everything was fairly normal for the first half hour or so. He got up to get another beer. The bar was busy, so he was gone for a while and came back with two more beers. He said the second one was mine, even though I never touched the first one. I told him I was good, still nursing the whiskey sour. I wanted to get silly, but not near this dude. Out of nowhere, he spoke up and said, You know, sometimes I have really bad anger problems. I'm kind of an asshole, and quite frankly, I didn't care if I offended the guy at this point, so I responded, Ah, so that's what's wrong with you. Hearing this, he got really quiet. We were sitting there in uncomfortable silence, which he finally broke by saying, I can't believe you would say that to me. I apologized, telling him I was in a bad mood and that I should probably just go home. He started to tell me that I can't take back what I said that he just wanted to love me, and that I won't let him. He even went on and asked how he was supposed to spend his life with me if I insulted him, and accused me of sleeping with other men. I was slack-jawed shocked at this, completely baffled. I tried to defuse the situation by saying, Look, I didn't mean to offend you, but I have to leave now, and I don't think it's a good idea for us to go on a second date. He got quiet again then stood up and punched the fence separating the patio from the street really hard before disappearing inside. People were staring at me, so I just stayed on the bench and smiled at them, lighting up another cigarette and hoping he had paid and left. It wasn't long before he came back out on the patio, shouting about how I had broken his heart. He continued on, saying how dare I try to use him for his money. I just sat there watching his freak out, remaining externally calm, but on the inside, I was terrified that this guy was going to get violent towards me. I stood up and reached into my clutch, pulled out ten dollars and gave it to him, thanking him for the beers I didn't drink, and then hightailed it to the bathroom. I stalled for about fifteen minutes, then decided that should probably be enough time for him to have gone away. I crept back outside and looked around, not seeing him anywhere. I approached the bouncer, who I was luckily close with since I was a regular at the bar, and asked him if the guy had left. He told me that they had to kick him out as soon as I went to the bathroom because he had started to follow me. They also told me that as they were dragging him out, he threatened to stab me for being a two-timing bitch. Obviously, I didn't feel comfortable walking the 20 minutes to my house, so I stayed at the bar for a few more hours until a close male friend of mine could walk me home, just in case. When I was 18, I got out of a three-year-long high school relationship, and it took me a while to slowly get back to my normal self. People kept telling me, oh, go online, meet someone, use a dating site. I was a little skeptical because of some of the horror stories I've heard about them, but I'm an anxious person and I didn't like the idea of going to a bar or somewhere public to meet people. 
So, after a few months of pressure from my friends, I decided to make an account on a dating site and see who I could find. There were some creeps, weirdos, and a few promising people. One guy named Tyler messaged me. He was quite handsome, really short, and had a good personality. So, I messaged back Tyler, and we talked for a week or two before we finally decided to meet. He came over to my house in his dirty work clothes and sat and talked to me and my mom. He didn't stay long, but my mom shook her head and said, I get a weird feeling from him. I don't like him. Being a typical 18-year-old, I got mad and told her it's my life and I'd choose who I wanted to date. We hung out and texted a lot for the next few months. Each week, he seemed to become more obsessive and jealous than the last. I started to feel like I was some sort of possession. When I finally told him I didn't like how he treated me, he said sorry and went back to being super nice again. I was still getting some red flags from him though, and about a week later, I decided enough was enough and I needed to end things. My friend and I would creep on him through her Facebook after the breakup because we thought his stupid pictures and dumb selfies were funny. He ended up getting a new girlfriend with three kids and immediately took the role of their father. He would talk about how he was absolutely in love with them and how they all felt the same. We peeked at his new life on Facebook for a long time, thinking that it was odd that he became their father figure so quickly. Out of nowhere, the post stopped. I went on Facebook one day and saw a local news story that a family of four was murdered. My heart sank when I saw the picture. It was Tyler's new family. Apparently, he became jealous of his girlfriend's ex-husband and murdered her and her three children, sparing the six-month-old baby they had together. Shortly after, he committed suicide before the police could find him. I've been extremely cautious of anyone I meet online since then. I was 20 years old at the time of this story. I had just left the Jehovah's Witness Church after being raised in the religion, more realistically a cult, for my whole life. Growing up, I wasn't allowed to be around non-witnesses, or worldly people, as they called them. I had no friends, and I felt like an alien assimilating to a foreign culture. I met this guy Nate while I was in a motorcycle safety class. After my experiences in the church, I wanted to be a badass and do every edgy thing I've never done before. He was a nice guy, around my age, and ended up asking me out. It was my first date. I was nervous. We went to dinner, and he asked me back to his place. I didn't want to be rude, and I was also super naive. I was surprised that he had his own home already. It was two stories and in a nice neighborhood. We sat and talked, and he offered to show me around. Again, being super naive, I said okay. He had four rooms upstairs. One door was closed. I asked him what was in there. He was hesitant, but opened the door to an all-pink, frilly, girly room. It looked dusty. We walked in, and I touched the bedspread. He started to scream and grab my arm, saying that I would change the germs on the bed. No one was allowed to touch anything in that room. It was all Lindsay's, and she wouldn't want it disturbed. We left the room quickly, and he crumbled to the ground in the hall crying. Not sure what to say, I told him I was really sorry. He said that she was his girlfriend and she should be back someday. They both decided to see other people, but he knew that she would return to him. I started to panic as he got more and more incoherent. My anxiety heightened when I heard the front door open downstairs and footsteps heading up. I saw an older couple walking towards us. The woman pulled Nate up from the floor while the man asked me to come downstairs. Not wanting to get involved in whatever was happening, I said I was just on my way out and thanked them for a nice evening. The older man interjected and asked me to sit down, placing Nate on the couch next to me. That's when they started yelling. They scolded Nate, saying how dare he have a girl over, and how dare he have sex with a whore, being so indecent before his god. I was completely freaked out at this point, frozen in fear until they finished their tirade. Finally, I spoke up and I said I was just his friend and had no intention of sleeping with him. Nate barely let me finish before he burst out to his parents that it was all their fault and that they never liked Lindsay in the first place. I grabbed my stuff and raced out the door. Behind me, I could hear them yelling profanities at my back. I never went back to that class. 
I learned that day that there are many crazy people in this world, and I don't go to anyone's home unless I know them well. In 2007, I went on a date with a guy from Craigslist. I was 17 years old at the time. I had put up an ad looking to meet someone. I don't remember the details. A guy responded who lived close to me, so I emailed him back and gave him my number. He was one of the only ones who responded without a creepy message. He said his name was John and that he was 26 years old. John and I spoke for two days over text before meeting that Friday night. He asked me if I was single and what kind of food I liked since he wanted to take me to a restaurant. I asked him a few questions about himself, too, and found out that he lived with his mother but had the top floor to himself. Apparently, he did some part-time modeling that made good money. Judging by the picture he had sent me, it was fairly believable that he was a model. Friday night came around and John arrived to pick me up. He sent me a message to let me know he was waiting outside, so I checked my hair and makeup one last time before saying goodbye to my parents and telling them I was heading out with friends and left. I got into John's silver two-door Ford and noticed right away that he looked exactly like his photo. Tall, dark, and handsome. He looked a little older in person, but made up for it with a snappy fashion sense. He looked cool and cute. He was incredibly kind, and his body language and smile totally put me at ease. Of course, it's really stupid to go on a date from Craigslist, but surprisingly, this guy seemed normal. We chatted for a while as he started driving away from my hometown towards the highway. He wanted us to drive into the city to go out to dinner, which wasn't too far, only about 25 minutes away. John started to reveal more details about himself throughout the drive. He said that he was embarrassed to tell me he lived with his mother, and that I might think bad of him for not having his own place at his age. As John got closer and closer to the highway, something felt off. I couldn't quite pinpoint it. It's not like he was creepy or anything, but I just started to feel uneasy. It reminded me of that feeling that you get when you're on a date with someone you're not sure about, and then they say something that happens to be one of your biggest turnoffs. Again, he didn't say anything creepy, he was just off-putting. As we got closer to the turnoff, I said as nicely as possible, I'm really sorry. I don't feel like going to dinner anymore. I'm not feeling well. John's initial reaction was sympathy. What's wrong? Are you okay? Is it my driving? I told him I just didn't feel well, but he kept questioning me, asking if it was something he did or said. I insisted that I just wasn't feeling that great. He responded, Okay, just let me drive around for a little bit before I take you back. I don't want to end the evening like this. I knew that without him driving me home, I'd have to walk for over an hour, maybe more, so I told him that driving around for a bit sounded like a fine idea. But instead of turning around and going back towards mine, he veered off and started heading to the town I knew he lived in. I should mention that it was pitch black out, and the town where John lived was surrounded by dense woods. While you can take the highway and proper turnoffs to get there, he decided he wanted to go via the back roads because it's more scenic, despite the fact that I couldn't see a thing. John had gone from being incredibly talkative to almost completely silent. He kept driving further into the wooded area. At times, I tried asking him questions about himself to break the awkward silence. At one point, I put my hand on his knee, affectionately trying to regain the friendly, flirty banter we had earlier. He blanked me for the most part, occasionally answering in soft grunts or nods. It was like he was throwing a tantrum. John pulled into the parking lot for the forest. It was around 9pm, so naturally, it was totally empty. He kept slowly driving, looking around for other cars and then parked right at the end, close to the woods. There was nobody else in the parking lot and I hadn't noticed us pass other cars to get there. For about 10 minutes, he just sat there, staring into the darkness ahead. It was disturbing. I managed to make small talk for maybe 5 minutes, which is a long time when the other person isn't talking back. Then, I joined him in his silence. I didn't want him to think I was overcompensating because I was scared. Some time of silence passed before John abruptly got out, closed the door, and locked the car. I was stuck inside. His lights were on so I could sort of see ahead. In front of the car was a field that went on for about 20 feet before the dense forest. 
To the left was the rest of the car park and exit at the far end, and to the immediate right was more forest with a small path. John disappeared into the forest ahead. I tried the handle on the door. It wouldn't open. I began trying to rationalize. Maybe he accidentally locked the door. I was telling myself that if he really wanted to do something bad, he would have stayed in the car. With no sight of John, I decided I needed to call someone. I looked around for my phone and couldn't find it. This was an old silver pay-as-you-go flip phone. I was confused that I couldn't find it because I had put it right next to me in the cup holder. After looking for a good few minutes, I became sure he had taken it. Mind you, I didn't want to start rooting around his car, knowing he might be watching me. I didn't want him to catch on to the fact that I was freaking out. I peeked around the car for my phone, only moving my eyes, trying to remain inconspicuous. I was petrified that this guy was watching me panic in the darkness. My eyes were darting all around the floor. Nothing. I looked up and squinted into the field and forest ahead. That's when I saw him. John was standing maybe ten feet from the car on that small field. He was smiling towards me. It wasn't a friendly smile. He looked horrifying. This was not the same guy I got in the car with earlier that night. I looked ahead and smiled back. I was still trying to act like his behavior was normal, like nothing he was doing was scary. Still smiling, his tongue began to protrude from his mouth. He stuck it out all the way. He began wagging his tongue up and down while maintaining eye contact with me. I felt myself trembling, trying to keep my composure. Not taking his eyes off of me, and with his tongue still out, he started unzipping his pants. He proceeded to urinate in front of the car, staring at me the whole time. This was the point where I started to find it difficult to go along with his behavior. I looked down at the floor, not wanting to watch what was in front of me. I could hear his thundering steps coming towards the car, then a slam against the window. I must have been the luckiest person in the world because another car pulled into the parking lot at that exact moment. Something about knowing someone else was around immediately snapped John out of his trance. He got back into the car and laughed at me, his normal laugh that I was used to from before, and asked me what kind of music I liked so he could put it on while he drove me home. And he did. He drove me all the way home. When we pulled up to my house, I went for the door handle, but it was still locked. I want you to promise me something, he said. I asked him what that was. If you see me, if you see me after this, turn the other way. Act like you don't know me. If you see me with my family, don't you dare say a word. I don't expect to bump into you, but don't say anything. I agreed, swallowing hard. I then asked him if he had seen my phone. He said no, but I figured my phone was a small sacrifice for surprisingly making it home okay. When I got inside, I said goodnight to my parents and went upstairs to my room. I turned on my computer right away. I wanted to gather as much information about this guy as I could. Back then, I used MSN Messenger, which logged in automatically when I started up my PC. A few days before all of this, I had been hanging out with my best friend. We had one of those friendships where we were constantly seeing who could pick on the other the most. It was all in good fun, and we would always end up laughing together. As a prank, she had swapped the names of two contacts on my phone. Mom was replaced with the guy I had been sexting back and forth with. I already knew she had done this, because I saw the previous messages with him the next time I used my phone, but I hadn't bothered to change the numbers back yet. When I logged into MSN, I had a ton of messages from this guy, and a few from my best friend. Apparently, when John locked me in the car and took my phone, he had texted Mom, telling her that I had decided to move out because I met someone. The message was ended with, Please don't look for me. I'm happy with being left alone. In an effort to sound like a teenage girl, John had replaced a bunch of the words with childish abbreviations. The guy who was saved as mom in my phone knew that I never texted like that, so aside from the messages themselves, this was a big red flag. He had responded to John's fake text by saying, I don't think this is you. I know where you went and I'm calling the police. This was incredibly quick thinking considering that he had absolutely no idea where I was. I think that text saved my life that night, and it definitely explained John's sudden change in behavior. 
If it hadn't been that random car, it was certainly from this text. We tried to find this guy online by name and by email, but couldn't find anything. It seemed like all the information he had given me was fake. My best friend pressed me to call the police, but I never did because I feared the consequences from my parents for going on a date with a guy I didn't know. My friend ended up telling my mom anyway. She also didn't call the police, but instead fulfilled my expectations by banning me from using my PC and grounding me from going out. Around three years later, I started dating this guy Chris who happened to live in the same town John had claimed to live in. We were talking about exes one day, and I shared my creepy encounter. I didn't even get halfway through the story before he stopped me and asked me some prying questions about John. Chris ended up sharing with me that this guy was now in prison for attacking and raping a 14-year-old girl, leaving her beaten and bloody in a nearby park. He was apparently known for being a creep way before that, earning the nickname Creepy John around town. He would go to the nearby parks where he knew younger girls hung out and would ask them to get in his car or if he could take their photo, always claiming that he was a model, like he had done with me. Chris first met John when he was 12 because John decided to take up skateboarding so he could make friends with the young boys at the skate park. He couldn't believe I had actually gotten in a car with him. Honestly, looking back, neither can I.